Ojibwe avoided Mishapakotan Island. Long ago, a group of Ojibwe were snowshoeing over the frozen lake when without explanation, the ice began breaking up. Terrified, they ran towards the island, but the closer they came, the further it drifted away. And so the belief was born that Mishapakotan was a mystical floating isle. And so goes the introduction of Mishapakotan Island in the book, Superior Under the Shadow of the Gods. Kayaking the mystical floating isle is a circumnavigation of Lake Superior's Mishapakotan Island. Seldom visited and remote, it's one of the most isolated islands on the Great Lakes. Rising through frequent fog banks, the island appears, disappears, reshapes, resizes, and seems to float over Superior's cold, clear waters. Once mined for copper and now home to the southernmost herd of woodland caribou, the island's rugged, often extremely exposed shoreline makes for a challenging and rewarding paddle. At its closest point, the island is about 10 miles off the rugged and isolated North Shore, approximately 35 miles west of the village of Mishapakotan. We hooked up with a local outfitter, Naturally Superior Adventures. We arrived at their beautiful Rock Island base camp on Saturday afternoon. My friend Dave, owner of NSA, led our group in a paddling skills workshop. Attention was given to paddling strokes like bracing and to rescue techniques. In the evening, while relaxing after dinner, which by the way featured delicious barbecued whitefish, our group was entertained by some of the local surfing kayakers having a run at the big waves in the mouth of the river. Man, these guys were good, and they were having a ball. Bright and early the next morning, we loaded our gear on the 60-foot fishing tug that would transport us out to the island. It was a bit of a tight fit, but we managed to squeeze everything aboard. As we left the beautiful fishing harbor, Dozens of seagulls began to follow us, as they must have hundreds of times before. During the long three-hour trip, I found myself captivated by the effortless flight of our tag-along moochers. They skimmed over the water with such grace and beauty, defying gravity. I was envious. As we approached the island, its 40-mile circumference seemed much more imposing than it did from the mainland. Once ashore, our first order of business was something to eat. Even one of the local dragonflies agreed. After lunch, we spent some time exploring the lighthouse grounds. All of the lights on the island are rich with history, and even though automation has taken them over, Signs of their caretaker families are easy to find. Flyers advertising this trip mention the island's wacky beavers. This guy swam right up to check us out.
paddling on that first afternoon was absolutely magnificent. Well, every good trip, I think, starts with an uh, offering. Um, Native legends describe the island as home to monsters, the underworld Manitou Mishapishu, the serpent that protected the island's copper. It was believed that removing copper from the island would awaken the sleeping monster and invoke his wrath. I, for one, did not want to meet Mishapishu, so an offering of sacred tobacco was made along with a promise to respect the island. Our first camp that evening brought home the tranquil feeling that we had arrived. After falling asleep to the sounds of the loons and the gentle surf, morning brought sun, warmth and good conversation. No, he didn't see me. He just thought what I might, might be doing, so he called up my friend's dad. Yes, they're going to the airport tomorrow. Why, did you have any problem with that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Parents always know if you see yourself. Our second day on the water, like the first, was calm and the paddling was beautiful. The Manitou was watching over us. Once we passed Bonnerhead, we went ashore to explore one of the abandoned copper mines. And see if we can find the copper. The early explorers knew of the existence of copper on the island as far back as the early 1600s. And by the early 1900s, the mines either went bankrupt or simply were abandoned. It seems the Manitou did protect the island's copper. None of us could resist Mishpakotan's very own water slide, even if it was a bit on the rough side. For our second campsite, we chose a beautiful beach next to some rocky headlands. It was pristine and we were the only ones there. During the night, the wind picked up and our beautiful beach became our home for the better part of the day. About midday, we took a hike down the beach to check out another abandoned copper mine. It was very easy walking in the woods, as caribou trails were everywhere. It scared me so bad, I started crying and we all had to leave. The brothers and sisters are all mad at me. <laughs> we ran across an open mine shaft and I could only imagine how hard it must have been for the men working in such cold, dank conditions. I wondered if this was where the Manitou lived. After proceeding another couple hundred yards down the beach, we came to a great cave that was about 50 feet up off the water. I found this place very inspiring and I wondered what ancient stories of survival were contained in the cave's walls. By late afternoon, the wind dropped enough to launch our boats, and we were soon pushing on to the west end of the island.
The sense of freedom we felt would be short-lived as the wind came back with a vengeance. We were driven ashore on a gravel tombolo just past Schaefer Bay. The wind rose to near gale force from the southwest, forcing us to make this spot our home for the evening. After some difficulty setting up the tents in the wind, we settled down for the evening dinner, followed by a bit of exploration. Sunsets here are nothing short of spectacular. Morning came with bright sunshine and lots of wind, so we decided to play it safe. We deferred the decision to launch or stay until afternoon. This would give us time to explore the area. It was interesting to me to check out some of the unusual plant life, like this saxifrage, which is an arctic disjunct, meaning that it normally grows far to the north in the subarctic regions. It thrives here because of the cold microclimate created by the lake. By late afternoon, with the wind still blowing strong and our weather radio predicting calming conditions overnight, we decided to stay put until morning. While exploring the caribou trails in the woods close to camp, Barry came across a large antler. The woodland caribou are virtually extinct in the lower 48 states, and it was very exciting to see them. Most survive in the far north regions of Canada. Back in the 60s, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources established a small herd on the island. With no natural predators, as wolves have not made the crossing to the island, the herd now numbers over a hundred. Holding a camera still in a bouncing boat with your heart pounding as one of these magnificent creatures stands directly in front of you was not easy to do. Barry was very proud of his find. As for the rest of us, our explorations brought back things like agates, pretty rocks, driftwood, and parts of fishnets that must have broken loose in a storm and drifted to shore. Morning arrived, and as predicted, the wind calmed down. Everybody was excited to get underway, so we all agreed to hurry and pack up. So I've just set up the map so we can take a look at so the proposed route for today. With everything ready to go, our strategy session covering the day's objectives convened, led by our capable guide, Steffi. Our guides were well organized, from logistics to equipment, menus to cooking, route planning to history. They covered all the bases. It's a good three kilometers in and then okay. paddle around in here. Um, from the reading that I was doing, I guess there's old buildings like the blacksmith shop and the old shop and, really? and uh, cabins and stuff like that. We had spent the better part of two days in this spot and it felt really good to be underway once again. We were now on the second half of our journey and would paddle around the West End Island Light and then head east along the south shoreline, which would expose us to the open lake. During the first hour of paddling, I noticed that our group had little conversation. I personally was feeling a bit uneasy and could only guess at the factors that contributed. Being windbound, the remoteness of our current location, the overcast sky, and the fact that everyone knew it took four days to get to the west end and we were to meet the fishing tug at the other end in only two days. Every so often, we would make a necessary stop, demonstrating our landing techniques. 
some were more inventive. A bit longer on the water and we came to West Sand Bay with its beautiful beach, which would be great for camping. However, we would only have lunch and move on. We eventually entered the mouth of Quebec Harbor and proceeded in to explore the remains of the once thriving fishing village. Billy Island. Billy Island actually this is small. Commercial fishing at Quebec Harbor dates from the mid 1800s and thrived until the 1950s when the sea lamprey decimated the fish population. Well, the one right on the shore, that's what they call the uh, packing house. Some family members of the former owners of the fishing village still maintain a cottage in the harbor. That was the big ice shed in the packing house. And then the one that uh, you see closest to the shore next, that's a little, that was a home. That's where Mort's mom and dad and oh, lived wow. in the summers when they came up. And then the one that's uh, with the black roof, that was a store. They operated a store like when you came in, you could buy gas, you could buy supplies, you could buy whatever, like they And then the others are little buildings there were all like little camps for the workers. I could only imagine what life must have been like a hundred years ago working at this isolated fishing village. There are several shipwrecks in and around the harbor and some items have been salvaged and brought to shore. We spent the night in the harbor and were back on the water fairly early, passing by the lighthouse on Davia Island. We had to make tracks as we needed to be at the east end by nightfall. Throughout the morning, we paddled on into a headwind with a sense of purpose. We were no longer sightseeing. I couldn't help wondering if the Manitou would allow us to reach our destination. By midday, we had paddled several hours and made good progress, even though the headwind had been gaining strength. It didn't take too much longer for the wind to become questionable, and when in doubt, the smart thing to do was to head to shore. So we landed on a gravel tombolo to have lunch and let a couple of hours pass to see if the Manitou would let us proceed. The downside of being windbound is obvious. You can't paddle. On the upside, in addition to feeling safe on shore, it affords the time to look at the detail around you. On this exploration, I picked up three rocks which I believe had copper deposits throughout. I was tempted to put them in my boat until I remembered the Ojibwe legend of Mishapishu, the giant serpent that protected the copper. Not wanting to add to our predicament, I promptly put them back. I found it easy to enjoy the beauty that surrounded us. 
It was very relaxing to observe the rugged shoreline bathed in warm amber colors. I felt comfortable and secure until I came across the skeletal remains of a caribou. I was immediately reminded just how precarious life can be on this remote and isolated island. At about 6 p.m., the wind began to slack, so we launched our boats and made the hour and a half sprint to Cozen's Cove with its redstone beaches. This is where the fishing tug would pick us up in the morning, and it would be our last campsite. We had made it. It felt very good to be there. The Manitou allowed us our success and would give us one final reward. On the shore next to our campsite, several caribou presented themselves to us. Breaking camp in the morning, we had some time to explore the cove before our mid-morning pickup by the fishing tug. pretty excited to see the fishing tug pull into the cove. That meant we were only one step away from a hot shower and a cold beer. Once on board with all our gear stuffed inside, it was time to relax. Isolated and remote, Lake Superior's Mishapakoten Island shares pristine nature with legend and history, the mystical floating isle. 